Thank you. Um, today he will present Rethinking as Ethical Practice, Creating Spaces for Critical Inquiry Within and Beyond Academia. Paul Hastings is the Executive Director and CEO of the Japan ICU Foundation. He's a graduate of Bowdoin College and received his MA in International Education from Teachers College of Columbia University. He is the recipient of the Aspen Institute's Nakusom yeah. Scholarship and is a Carnegie Council new leader. Paul speaks Japanese as well as basic Sinhalese and Nepali. He is an avid outdoorsman and international traveler, and he lives with his wife and two sons in Maplewood, New Jersey. Paul is also part of the Rethinking Peace Studies Project, which is an academic initiative that seeks to rethink peace and conflict studies through an interdisciplinary lens. This project is a partnership between the Japan ICU Foundation from International Christian University, ICU in Japan, and the Rutgers Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights, again, CJHR. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Paul Hastings to Rutgers. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Um, well, I want to first thank uh, Lynette Seeger, who's not here, I don't think, um, and Megan Sullivan uh, for inviting me uh, to speak today um, and for organizing this colloquium. Um, whoops, that's, the, hold on, all right, we'll get there. Um, over the past several years, um, I've uh, developed numerous uh, connections with Rutgers, uh, and specifically within the Division of Global Affairs. Uh, for the past three years, I have worked with Alex Hinton, uh, who's here, uh, Nella Navarro, um, who many of you know, uh, and their colleagues at the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights. Um, on specifically on a collaboration, uh, which I'll be speaking about more uh, later today, uh, Rethinking Peace Studies. Um, I've also had a chance to work with your director, Jean-Marc Boicot, uh, through the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs, um, and specifically their Global Ethics Network, uh, which he and I have been involved in. Uh, and in addition, it was my uh, privilege uh, to have had the chance to get to know the late Clem Price, um, who was an inspiration to many uh, here at Rutgers and within the broader Newark community. Um, my name is Paul, as you just heard. Uh, as you heard also, I'm the executive director of the Japan ICU Foundation. Um, our mission is to work with International Christian University, uh, ICU, in Tokyo, Japan, uh, to further strengthen their global programs and academic excellence. ICU uh, is one of Japan's leading institutions of higher education. Uh, its emphasis is on the liberal arts, and is unique, uh, which is quite unique within Japan and uh, in Asia. Uh, courses are taught in English and in Japanese. Uh, ICU offers 31 majors in the natural and social sciences and humanities, um, also interdisciplinary majors uh, such as uh, gender and sexuality studies and environmental studies. Uh, they have international partnerships with universities in 23 countries. Uh, here in the United States, they have partnerships with uh, the likes of Middlebury College in Vermont, the University of California system, uh, Georgetown University, and Rutgers University. Um, a few brief words about ICU's history that are uh, relevant to today's talk. Um, ICU was founded after World War II as a project of reconciliation between uh, mostly Japan and the United States. The ICU campus, which you see here, uh, before it was the ICU campus, uh, it was situated on land that was uh, housed a research facility for the development of fighter jets uh, for the Japanese uh, Air Force. ICU was, um, uh, in many ways, part of the post-war reconciliation uh, framework in the same spirit as the Bretton Woods institutions uh, and also the introduction of international human rights standards. Indeed, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, spoke uh, about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at ICU's first commencement. And ICU students to this day sign a pledge to adhere to the declaration when they matriculate. A couple of photos. Um, so this is the ICU campus before uh, it was ICU. Um, it was called the Nakajima Research Facility. Uh, the main building here, um, which still stands today, uh, was the research center. And then you can see the airport hangar back here. Uh, you can see, you can't see all of it, but there was a runway that went right here, um, which is now the main entrance to the university campus. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned already, they were developing uh, specifically military technology uh, before uh, and during the war. Um, 
this is a pretty dramatic image um, of Tokyo uh, after the firebombings of Tokyo. Uh, many people perhaps are not aware that more people died in the firebombings of Tokyo than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. Uh, pretty much the entire city was completely decimated. Uh, carpet bombing is what it was. This is a hard image to look at, but this is a, an example of um, the devastation uh, that was caused during the fire bombings of Tokyo. This is a pile of human remains. Now, switching gears, <laughs> dramatic switch. Uh, this is the ICU campus in the past you know, couple of years. Um, this is the main quad. That building that you see there is the research facility, which is now the main academic building, or the Hongkang, as it's called. This is another beautiful image of a tea house on the ICU campus that also predates uh, the founding of the university. Um, here's a group of ICU students on the quad. Um, and then, none other than Eleanor Roosevelt uh, giving the commencement speech. And behind her is the first president of ICU, Hachiro Yuasa. So I mention all of this at the outset partly because uh, it sets the context for our, our involvement in rethink, rethinking peace studies, which aims to deconstruct normative frameworks such as reconciliation, peace, and human rights. And we'll talk about this a bit more later. So the organization that I lead, the Japan ICU Foundation, um, achieves its mission by offering grants and scholarships to ICU students. You just saw. That's a nicer image to keep to stay on. We'll just keep it on that image. <laughs> um, and also uh, by running global programs such as Rethinking Peace Studies. Uh, we have a staff of five, uh, and our offices are on Riverside Drive in New York City, uh, across the street from Barnard College and Riverside Church, for those of you who are familiar with Morningside Heights. Um, and then before delving into today's topic, I want to share also a bit um, about my background and how I've come to this work. Um, my grandfather, uh, I'll just start there, I can start anywhere, I guess, in my history, but my grandfather uh, served in the U.S. Army uh, during World War II as a tank commander. Uh, he took part in the first wave of attacks at Omaha Beach on D-Day. Um, after surviving and participating in the liberation of France, he and his fellow combat veterans were deployed to the Pacific and were actually preparing for the invasion of mainland Japan, which fortunately for me and many others never occurred. Uh, about 30 years later, in the late 1970s, uh, his son, my dad, uh, moved to Japan with my mom to teach English. Uh, this was before I was born, um, but we did move um, with my family to Japan when I was four years old. And I grew up for 11 years in uh, Kanazawa, Kobe, and Tokyo, uh, for those of you familiar with Japan. I attended a Japanese elementary school, uh, followed by international schools for middle and high school. Um, my itinerant childhood led me to question my identity at a young age. Um, on one hand, I was a gaijin, a uh, foreigner. Uh, I didn't belong, I was on the outside. Um, however, I was also an insider. Um, I was bilingual. My best friends were Toru and Yukun, uh, and I loved watching Dragon Ball and Doraemon and things of that sort on TV. Um, then I moved from Tokyo to Brunswick, Maine to attend Bowdoin College. I studied abroad in Sri Lanka and lived in India after college for six months. Um, all of these international experiences, experiences including uh, Bowdoin in Maine, uh, which was just as foreign to me as India, um, have uh, furthered my understanding of the complexity of human life. The frames through which I view the world are still limited, like all of ours. Um, and each and every person, uh, sorry. However, uh, learning new languages and communing with and befriending people of various countries um, has led me to my work in international education. Uh, it's also brought me to critical theory and to the approach we have taken in organizing Rethinking Peace Studies. Today, I will talk about the importance of creating time and space for critical inquiry within and outside of academia. Specifically, I argue that critique is an ethical act. Uh, my talk is broken into two sections. First, I will briefly introduce critical theory and we'll explore uh, three works um, by Barbara Johnson, Michel Foucault, and Judith Butler, respectively. Then I'll discuss Rethinking Peace Studies, a three-year program we'll be wrapping up this June uh, with the Rethinking Peace Studies con conference on the ICU campus in Tokyo. All right, critical theory uh, emerged in the 1920s uh, in, at the Institute of Social Theory at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, later, a group of theorists associated with the Institute became known collectively as the Frankfurt School. 
Uh, the Frankfurt School was not an institute per se, uh, but rather a loosely connected group of theorists, mostly philosophers and psychologists, social theorists. Uh, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, George Lukacs, Eric Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, uh, these uh, were people who were closely associated with the Frankfurt School, as well as uh, Walter Benjamin and later on uh, Jürgen Habermas, uh, who's still with us today, actually. Um, here is an image of um, Horkheimer on the left and um, Adorno on the right in the front, and then Jürgen Habermas is in the back right with his hand up and on his head. Um, Critical theory emerged as a response uh, to major historical shifts, such as the Re Russian Revolution, but also to uh, positivism, uh, or scientific rationality, as well as to metaphysics. Um, in his primer on critical theory, your very own uh, professor, Stephen Bronner, writes, uh, these seemingly opposed philosophical outlooks, again, positivism and metaphysics, were seen as flip sides of the same coin each mechanically defined by what it opposes, opposes, yet they converge in their contemplative preoccupation with philosophical foundations, unalterable categories for inter interpreting reality, and fixed notions for verifying experience or truth claims. In other words, critical theorists rejected attempt, attempts to construct a unifying totality, and instead opted for critical deconstruction of normative categories such as history, society, identity, etc. As Bronner writes, critique recalls what history forgets by rummaging around the ruins and putting the garbage to use in sparking the imagination. The totality now makes way for a constellation of juxtaposed empirical facts that illuminates a particular theme or concept for which members of the audience must provide ever-changing connections and interpretations. Thus, in the spirit of critical theory in the following, I hope to weave together works by three theorists uh, to illuminate today's theme. I look forward to hearing your reactions, um, or rather, the ever-changing connections and interpretations you will inevitably have um, to my presentation, as well as to a fruitful discussion afterwards. I want to first turn to Barbara Johnson, uh, specifically to her short essay, The Critical Difference, which was published in 1978. Uh, in this essay, Johnson examined Roland Barthes' critical deconstruction of Balzac's novella Saracen. Uh, it's a really great example of how critical theory can be utilized in the deconstruction of a text, um, and it illuminates the importance of rereading, uh, which is a corollary of rethinking. Uh, we have uh, thus utilized this essay in our Rethinking Peace Studies readers, uh, which I'll discuss more later. In the essay, Johnson writes, difference is not what distinguishes one identity from another. It is not a difference between, or at least not between independent units. It is a difference within. Far from constituting the text's unique history, it is that which subverts the very idea of identity, infinitely deferring the possibility of adding up uh, the sum of a text's parts or meanings and reaching a totalized, integrated whole. In other words, a text identity is not static or totalizing, but rather fluid and open to interpretation. She goes on to claim that difference cannot ever be affirmed as an ultimate value because it is that which subverts the very foundations of any affirmation of value. So let's ponder that for a second, um, because I think it really does get to the very crux of critical theory, um, and it also has far-reaching implications. So in fact, let's reread it. Difference cannot ever be affirmed as an ultimate value because it is that which subverts the very foundations of any affirmation of value. Uh, Bart also uh, talks about difference, um, and in this essay she does quote Bart, and let's, I have one quotation from him about difference, which is a very similar um, concept. Difference is not, obviously, some complete irreducible quality it is not what designates the individuality of each text, what name, signs, finishes off each work with a flourish. On the contrary, it's a difference with which does not stop and which is articulated upon the infinity of texts, of languages, of systems, a difference which each text is the return. If identity is in constant flux, we must utilize critical tools that honor and respect this complexity. 
So in this instance, the tool Johnson and Bart advocate is rereading. Uh, Bart states, rereading is an operation contrary to the commercial and ideological habits of our society, which would have us throw away the story once it has been consumed so that we can then move on to another story, buy another book, and which is tolerated only in certain marginal categories of readers, children, old people, and professors. Rereading is here suggested at the outset, for it alone saves the text from repetition. Those who fail to reread are obliged to read the same story everywhere. Again, let us reread that one line. Those who fail to reread are obliged to read the same story everywhere. These are strong words uh, that resonate in our society of sequels and prequels, of formulaic marketing schemes and sedate politics. So if we agree with Bart and Johnson that rereading or rethinking is required to appreciate the complexity of human consciousness and experience, and therefore our own lived experience, then the critical act is an ethical act. In other words, the critical act is a prerequisite to living one's best life. To further explain this leap from the critical to the ethical, I want to now turn to Michel Foucault. There he is. Um, to begin, I'll summarize how Foucault distinguishes between morality uh, focused on the other life, uh, scientific rationality, and ethics that's grounded in the care for the self. Uh, then I'll move to Foucault's analysis of parisia, or truth-telling, uh, ex exemplified by the cynical tradition. Um, and here I'm referring to his final lectures that were given at the Collège de France before his premature death at age 57 from complications with AIDS. These lectures have been published in a volume titled The Courage of Truth, The Government of the Self and Others Too, which I highly encourage everyone to read. In the spirit of critical theory, Foucault differentiates between metaphysics, scientific rationality, and ethics. He claims that morality is often understood within the metaphysical context of transcendence. At least within the Western tradition, religion has sort of a monopoly on morality. Uh, this is self-evident for anyone with a cursory understanding of the Abrahamic faiths. As Foucault writes, it is as if philosophy was able to disburden itself of the problem of the true life to the same extent as religion, religious institutions, asceticism, and spirituality took over this problem in an increasingly evident manner from the end of antiquity down to the modern world. As a consequence, morality within the modern world is chiefly concerned with the truth of the other life, which is often understood as the religious afterlife, and not pri primarily with the truth of this life. Simultaneously, Foucault takes issue with the scientific method because it eliminates the need for eth ethical truth-telling. As he writes, if scientific practice scientific institutions and integration within the scientific consensus are by themselves sufficient to assure access to the truth, then it is clear that the problem of the true life as the necessary basis for the practice of truth-telling disappears. So he concludes by stating, so there has been a confis confiscation of the problem of the true life in the religious institutions and an invalidation of the problem of the true life in the scientific institutions. Here, Foucault sees an opening for Parisia, or truth-telling, and particularly what he calls ethical Parisia. As he writes, ethical Parisia involves neither the chain of rationality, as in technical teaching, nor the soul's ontological mode of being, but the style of life, the way of living, the very form that one gives to life. To further ground the idea of ethical Parisia, Foucault turns to, ancient philosophical, the, to the ancient philosophical tradition of the cynics. He identifies five basic principles on, of cynicism. They are, first, that philosophy is a preparation for life. Two, that preparation entails above all else that one takes care of oneself. Three, that in order to take care of oneself, one must only study what is really useful in and for existence. Four, that one must make one's life conform to the precepts that it formulates, and, or that one formulates. And fifth, that one must alter or change the value of the currency. While the first four principles are evident uh, in other strands of philosophy, such as Stoicism and Epicureanism, it's the fifth principle that is unique to cynicism. 
It's also the fifth principle wherein the link is made between critical theory and ethics. Foucault writes, what is important is that the principle that you must alter your currency or change the value of your currency is regarded as a principle of life and even as the most fundamental and typical cynic principle. In other words, the fifth principle is the critical principle. To live one's best life, one must be critical or change the value of the currency. As Foucault states, the principle gives form to life, just as the coin's effigy gives a form to the metal on which it is stamped, and one thereby reveals other lives, the lives of others, to be no more than counterfeit, coin with no value. Thus, values circulate, but are not totalizing nor static. Cynicism forces a critical rethinking of value. Foucault explains that the job of the cynic is to start from a certain coin which carries a certain effigy, erase that effigy, and replace it with another which will enable this coin to circulate with its true value. In other words, the job of the cynic is the job of the critic. The critical act is an act of caring for the self. It is an ethical act. Having further developed the linkage between critical theory and ethics, I'd like now to move to Judith Butler's reflections on political violence which is an excellent contemporary example of ethical parisia and critical theory. Specifically, I want to briefly touch on her book's Precarious Life um, and its follow-up, Frames of War, wherein Butler reflects on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the war on terror, the United States invasion and occupation of Iraq, amongst other uh, recent acts of political and ongoing acts of political violence. Our lives are grievable. She states that specific lives cannot be apprehended as injured or lost if they are not apprehended as living. If certain lives do not qualify as lives or are from the start not conceivable as lives within certain epistemological frames, then these lives are never lived nor lost in the full sense. How can we learn to see beyond the frames that are presented to us? How can we grieve the millions of lives destroyed by political violence? often perpetrated by our own government. Butler argues that what is necessary is both the construction of new frames, but also a critical inquiry of existing normative structures. She writes, what happens when a frame breaks with itself is that a taken for granted reality is called into question, exposing the orchestrating designs of the authority who sought to control the frame. This suggests that it is not only a question of finding new content, but also of working with received renditions of reality to show how they can and do break with themselves. So for example, she compares the embedded reporting that was required and organized by the Department of Defense during the Iraq War uh, to the photographs, uh, photographs of torture that leaked uh, from Abu Ghraib. In the latter case, the DOD's framing of the war was cracked wide open, exposing the tortured bodies of the nameless, the formerly invisible prisoners. So here's a photograph of embedded reporting. You can see um, there's a lot of great reporting going on here, really seeing the whole context, <laughs> developing a really broad frame. Uh, obviously, I'm being facetious. Um, and then you have this image, which we're all familiar with, which came out of Abu Ghraib, which, of course, the DOD you know, did not want to be shown to anybody. But this happened. This is part of the war. I can't just stay on that photograph, sorry, <laughs> it's, too, it's too much. Uh, so I'll just move to this one. But, uh, grieving unseen victims of violence requires both the deconstruction of existing frames and the creative construction of new frames. However, the critical act remains paramount because ultimately state power and political violence require agreed upon frameworks that transcend state power. As Butler explains, and this is a bit of a long quote, the state both produces and presupposes certain operations of power that work primarily through establishing a set of ontological givens. Among those givens are precisely notions of subject, culture, identity, and religion, whose versions remain uncontested and incontestable within particular normative frameworks. So when we speak about frameworks in this respect, we are not simply talking about theoretical perspectives that we bring to the analysis of politics, but about modes of intelligibility that further the workings of the state, and as such are themselves exercises of power, 
even as they exceed the specific domain of state power. She goes on, on the one hand, it's possible to say that such reductions, however falsifying, are necessary because they make, reason, they make possible normative judgments within an established and knowable framework. The, des, the, des, the desire for epistemological certainty and certain judgment thus produces a set of ontological commitments that may or may not be true, but which are deemed necessary in order to hold firm to existing epistemological and ethical norms. On the other hand, the practice of critique as well as the practice of providing a more adequate historical understanding, focus on the violence affected by the normative framework itself, thus offering an alternative account of normativity based less on re ready judgment than on the sorts of comparative evaluative conclusions that can be reached through the practice of critical understanding. Here we have returned again to critique, or the changing of the value of the coin. For Butler, critique is, a cent is, is central when analyzing political violence. While it may not be possible or even preferable to throw out normative frameworks entirely, critique is an ethical act that creates fissures in the frame, allowing us to glance beyond, to grieve the formerly invisible, to shed tears for the dying Syrian child. Now that we have briefly reviewed critical theory, established its ethical dimension, and uh, shown how important critique is, uh, in particular to the examination of violence, I'd like to turn to rethinking peace studies. I'll begin by providing some background to RPS, rethinking peace studies, RPS, uh, explaining how we came to partner with the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights here at Rutgers. I'll, uh, I will then explain the methodology we have followed in organizing the program. I will introduce the themes we have chosen and the accompanying readers uh, for each seminar and will also touch on the RPS conference which is coming up in June. Finally, I'd like to briefly discuss our plans to continue our partnership with Rutgers. However, before delving in, I want to stress that RPS is first and foremost, foremost a critical exercise. As I have just argued, critique is a form of ethical paresia. I am convinced of the necessity of creating time and space for critical theory within and outside of academia. This is our aim. You know, while peace studies is the subject matter we're interrogating. In 2012, my organization co-sponsored the Aspen Institute's Cultural Diplomacy Forum on the ICU campus in Tokyo. The theme of the forum was the, act, the art of peace building and reconciliation. A series of panel discussions and keynote speech, speeches were held over three days, attended by over 100 people from six continents and over 20 countries. Alex Hinton, uh, and uh, Clem Price were two of the participants, and this was my first opportunity to uh, meeting both of them. While the forum was a wonderful experience, many of us felt the discussions lacked depth. Afterwards, I visited with Alex and Clem here in Newark to discuss further collaboration, uh, and R RPS is what emerged from that meeting. So after, nu after numerous planning sessions, we coalesced on the name of Rethinking Peace Studies, which Alex deserves credit for thinking up. Um, around the same time, two faculty members at ICU, Jeremiah Alberg and Giorgio Shani, agreed to sign on as members of the organizing committee. Together, uh, we agreed to the format of three seminars, uh, followed by a culminating conference. The seminars have been, uh, or have been held every six months between uh, November 2014 um, and uh, November of 15. The conference will be held this June. The first seminar uh, was held on the ICU campus in Tokyo, which you've seen, uh, the second in New York City, and the third in Kandy, Sri Lanka. Here's an image from the first seminar on the ICU campus. Um, here's a picture of the second seminar, and here's a picture of the third seminar in Sri Lanka. Um, each of the seminars uh, revolved around a theme the first was translation, the second memory, and the third dialogue. These broad themes were meant to act as avenues for critiquing peace studies. A cap was set at 15 participants for each seminar. We set strict criteria for inviting participants. First, they could not be from within our own networks. Oftentimes, academic conferences and programs end up being gatherings of friends and colleagues who know each other's work well. This. Um, is fine on the surface, but it limits the opportunity for critical thinking. Second, uh, we consider geography, nationality, gender, academic discipline, and also invited artists, writers, and practitioners outside of academia. 
Uh, 200 page readers were compiled for each seminar, including sections on rethinking, on peace studies, um, and on the seminar theme. Apart from requiring partic seminar participants to read or reread the materials, uh, the seminars were deliberately unstructured. No one presented papers or gave talks. Rather, the participants were encouraged uh, to consider, I'm sorry, were encouraged to consider what it is that we are rethinking and what it means to rethink. The seminars were facilitated by the organizers, but in large part, the conversation was fluid. <clears throat> in contrast, the RPS conference in June will be uh, more structured. We have invited all of the RPS seminar participants to submit papers for the conference, which they will then read and receive feedback on. A selection of these papers will be included in an edited volume tentatively titled Rethinking Peace Studies, Translation, Memory, and Dialogue. We are also pleased that Johan Galtung and Ashish Nandi will be presenting keynote addresses at the conference. For those of you unfamiliar with Gautam uh, and Nandi, I recommend you look into their writings. Also, <clears throat> please take a look at the website, rethinkingpeacestudies.com, which includes links to more information about the participants. Uh, we've had some truly remarkable people join our seminars, including the poet Carolyn Fourche, the writer Sketu Mehta, and the revolutionary artist Bahia Shihab. To conclude, I would like to say a few words about the future. Rethinking Peace Studies uh, has piqued the interest of many people, which has been immensely encouraging. We are now considering creating a more long-term critical theory, a uh, critical program called Rethinking X. Uh, Rethinking X would give us an opportunity to critically examine various subject matters. Uh, please let me know if you're interested in learning more about Rethinking X. Uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity. I look forward to hearing your reactions and views and to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. You gotta take off. See ya. So we can open it up if anybody has <coughs> questions. Yeah. Is there any problem within um, peace studies? So you came up with the idea of thinking about peace studies. For, for example, like Perhaps there is canonization in these studies? Yeah. Well, I think that's, in other words, there is sort of a normative framework that exists within peace studies, and there's a canon, uh, right, is what you're getting at? Yeah, and, and actually, Johann Gautung, who's coming to the conference, is kind of known as one of the kind of leading figures in peace studies, and, you know, like um, concepts such as um, negative and um, um, uh, negative peace, positive peace, uh, cultural violence, structural violence, etc. Those are all concepts that he kind of um, uh, developed, if you will, uh, amongst with others. Um, absolutely, I think this is partly why we're running Rethinking Peace Studies, is because it seems as though the theoretical component or framework uh, is a bit staid. You know, it's a little bit kind of old and it, it, it needs rethinking. I mean, everything, as I've argued, requires rethinking. I mean, rethinking, I think, is the first step. Before you can create anything new and constructive, you have to do the critical piece. So, you know, um, there's no you know, big, you know, hope or grand vision, per se. Um, that's not what we're about. Um, although, you know, we're encouraging, you know, in people who are involved, if they have ideas and they want to pursue them, you know, they're creative, uh, and it might kind of expand or, um, create new frameworks for peace studies, if that's even the term that they want to use, that's fine. Um, but yeah, no, I think there is a lot of problems in terms of the sort of canonization of um, various concepts, of various works within the field of peace studies. But I mean, you guys are here in academia, you know this, this problem exists throughout academia uh, in any discipline. Uh, there's this attempt or this idea that you know these, these things are enshrined uh, and, and then they're broken down, and then there, and there's a new thing that's enshrined, and it's broken down. And so that's, of course, part of you know, intellectual life, and it's inevitable, and it's probably very um, healthy, in a sense. I'm not sure if that gets at your question at all. If you want to, if you have ideas about sharing, you know. No, because uh, I think, so, for example, like, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic proposal of critical theory is so, that so, uh, trying to reveal something that's we already accept as a as a what we call as a bedrock of particular studies. So I want to know about the, what we call as the bedrock of peace studies today. So 
everybody in this picture came up with something oh. to unpack or something. Sure. Yeah, so the unpacking um, is ongoing. Um, and in fact, the sort of the way that we structured it is that you have the three seminars, which are very much opportunities to sort of delve into this and with each other and with the um, material, and then to step away from the seminars and to write. And so that's where a lot of the actual unpacking occurs. So that's going on right now in preparation for the conference. We've um, asked everybody who's coming to the conference to submit an abstract and a paper of original work um, that does critique peace studies um, in some way or another. So the, I think also the themes that we introduce to each seminar are very important. Um, you know, translation, uh, memory, and dialogue, because uh, they're essentially inflection points. So you know, um, it's an interdisciplinary program. So in translation, you have many people from coming from English literature or from you know, translation studies itself who are invited to the um, seminar who had no background in peace studies, right? And this is part of the kind of the purpose of this, and it's very intentional in that way. Um, but then you have, you know, a reader where you have like a piece on critical thinking, then you have a piece on peace studies itself. So for example, I mean, you know, negative and positive peace and cultural violence, structural violence, etc., direct violence, and you know, these I think like in many ways those still are uh, that is sort of the the, the theoretical framework with, that peace studies uh, operates within. But seeing and understanding that that is part of a framework that exists within state power, right, is really important, especially for peace studies, because you know political violence is obviously so devastating for so many people, and, um, and that's where I think the again we are not like peace studies is the subject that we're critiquing, but the approach that we're taking is not as like, peace activists or you know rah rah we can have world peace. Like obviously that's not the case. Um, you know, the whole point is to approach it by under, you know, from a critical lens, so that you understand how even peace studies itself, you know, is part of the normative framework, right? So you have, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I like I, I'm really curious to see what papers come in. We've been getting the abstracts, but I guess I'm not like I don't have all of the answers. Once the book comes out, those will hopefully have. You know, they'll they'll address your question more directly and much more um, well, much more depth. But I mean, I'm hopeful that there can be something uh, like a, you know, in a sense, you're talking about both the deconstruction, but also you're talking about the construction of new frames. So I think they go hand in hand, as we've just as I've just mentioned or argued. But I don't think we're there yet at the construction of new frames. <laughs> It, we're in the middle of the deconstruction process, if you will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the Rethinking X project, or you can't really say too much about it yet? Well, I don't, there's not all that much, much to say. it's still early, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. The basic idea is that, you know, again, Rethinking Peace Studies has been, um, there's been quite a lot of interest, you know, expressed by different institutions, by different people, and um, and I think, you know, we want to harness that enthusiasm, but it's not, we're not interested in having another program on peace studies, right? Again, like the whole point of this is a critical exercise. And so the idea is that it's, it's kind of surprising, right? Or it surprised me that there aren't more academic activities like this. Right, where you have like seminars that are very unstructured, where people can just like talk to each other, and especially people from different disciplines, and even also people from outside of academia. So that's been a realization, right? So okay, there's not that much going on in this realm, so why don't we do something in this realm, right? So Rethinking X is basically an opportunity for us to continue with the sort of methodological formation that we have, or structure that we have. Um, but apply it to different subject matters, right? So you could do like rethinking ethics. So X is just you know there as the kind of meta structure, but then within that you'll have like rethinking gender or rethinking ethics or rethinking whatever. I mean you can apply it to anything, you know, rethinking uh, McDonald's. I mean it doesn't. The point is that well obviously we're not going to do that, but you know like there are a lot of really important normative frameworks out there, right? I mean religion. You know, nationality, gender, sexuality, all of these things, you know, 
there's things happening in all these areas, and there's people who are involved in critiquing them and whatnot, but there aren't that many opportunities to really just have a, a sort of a gathering where you can, it's sort of like a luxury in a sense. Um, and we're aware of that, and you know, so it, it's, it's a privileged, to, you know, it's a privileged activity, but I think that hopefully it does have some value, you know, in the end, we'll, we'll see, I guess. <laughs> So, I mean, the idea is that maybe we do like two seminars and then a conference, right, on the subject. So maybe we'll do, I think one of the ideas we have is rethinking the human, which is a pretty broad and big, you know, <laughs> idea. But you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot there you can work with and you can approach it from so many different directions. So maybe we do two seminars and then we would have a conference and then we'd come out, we'd, we'd publish a book. So that's another big piece of this is that the, the book the edited volume that will be emerging out of the conference, uh, which will be you know, edited by probably Alex, um, and we're still figuring out with all the various logistics. But, so, um, yeah. I don't know what if you want specifically to know of something. Sorry. No, I have a follow-up question to that, though. Yeah. I don't know if there were any people invited to rethinking peace studies or if you would consider this in the future, but policymakers, I know it's mostly like a scholarly enterprise, but I'm wondering if that was thought of, if that might be an interesting dynamic uh, because usually policy operates so much within these- Within the structures. Within these structures and yeah. frameworks. To yeah. We, yeah, no, absolutely. We actually did invite uh, policymakers. Um, there was one person from a you know, high UN official that was going to be coming to Sri Lanka and then she had a health issue that she had to back out in the last minute. Um, but absolutely, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you know, with your access to the United Nations and whatnot, I know that DGA does a lot, you know, with um, people, like with policymakers. Um, Jean-Marc Poicot obviously is, you know, deeply in, embedded within that structure uh, as well. I mean, he's an academic and he critiques it, but um, no, I think it's very valuable. Ac um, policymakers, journalists, um, artists, I mean, yeah, absolutely. The idea is not to, and I think we, we ended up kind of maybe by default, you know, with a lot of academics, uh, but all of the academics that came, I think almost entirely, like they weren't just kind of pure researchers, you know, were, I mean, many of them were involved in um, like a lot of creative pursuits, if you will. Like uh, Nitin Sani, he's at the New School, for example, I mean, he, um, you met him, yeah. That he, uh, you know, he does a lot of, um, you know, art, creative art, work with artists and, and dance, and dance and things of that sort. So, no, absolutely, yeah. It's, I think it's, it's very important because, and this is part of my talk. The title is, you know, within and outside of academia. You know, I'm not an academic. I don't have a PhD. I'm not a professor. So, you know, I kind of straddle that world as well, but. Um, Any final question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, just like um, thinking about what uh, Kelsey said about like how uh, this kind of uh, rethinking will have to you know, deal with the policymakers in the end. So, what's like the final goal of this uh, project? Like, how do you explain it to the average Joe uh, Streets or someone from my country? Yeah, sure. Yes. About so. I'm not sure I agree entirely with your premise. It's an important part yeah. of it, but it's not. Policymakers are influenced by the normative structures. Yes, absolutely, like how your your question is sort of about um, applicability or um, impact, you know, of this program. And I mean, I'm not. We're not activists, right? And so we're we're, we're the focus is on the critique. The critique is an ethical practice, as I you know, have tried to explain, and that, I think, has value in itself. I would love to find ways of connecting with like broader, um, you know, policy, the policy world, or, um, but it's very difficult. I mean, these things are very entrenched. And so if you can make an impact by critiquing things, and if it can slowly kind of, you know, spread, and then, you know, because these things do, these can, concepts, like for example, um, you know, this is a lot of Alex Hinton's work is about analyzing sort of policy um, discussions and uh, concepts that kind of go in and out of vogue, right? 
so you have like an idea like um you know I mean like human rights which is obviously very problematic and has been critiqued a lot by many different people um, but then you have human security that comes up you know and then like then that gets critiqued and then you know you have this you know human dignity and then you have you know justice and global justice and these big concepts that you know they are being influenced by the work of critical theorists you know but you, I mean you're it, it's a very valuable and a I mean important dimension I just don't know how to I don't know the answer <laughs> It's a really hard one, uh, and uh, you know maybe like getting more policymakers, you know, making a strong point of inviting more policymakers to the table. But what tends to happen when you invite policymakers, because you know, they're professional bureaucrats, right? So the, when you, what happens when you invite professional bureaucrats is that they want to maintain their livelihood, right? And so it's there's a there's a sort of you know pushback. You know they need to have their human security. You know, they need to have their international development. They need to have their human rights, or else they don't have a job. So, when it comes to that type of economic, you know, dimension, it's there's a lot of pushback, and uh, it's really hard. I don't know. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not a revolutionary. I mean, maybe to a, I mean, some some of these ideas are revolutionary, but they're you know, I'm. So, I mean, maybe I'm not a cynic myself. Maybe I'm not practicing what I preach enough, you know, I don't know, <laughs> not preach, but you know, so it's, it's, but it's really, it's a really hard, um, it's a really good question. <laughs> and I hope you have, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm, um, I'm a civil servant slash um, academia in Indonesia slash now international graduate student. So I know how hard it is if I come back to, after I finish my master in Australia, and I come back to my university, and I try to teach what I really learned in Australia. Yeah. You know, uh, introduce some of the new stuff in the IR theories from my students. Yes. It's kind of hard. And how I, co I can convince my colleague that we need this new subject in IR because this is what's going on in the world. Uh -huh. And then we have to like uh, change the curriculum and then change the, the, the approaches. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. And I was the battle. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, but maybe one maybe one response to that is that you know what you're talking about is sort of the um, the flow of normativity normative frameworks right so you know when you go and this is ha this happens all the time you know in international education it's the same thing you know you study about or you learn about um, you know at teachers college for example there are a lot of um, countries that will send you know mid-level bureaucrats to do master's degrees and studies and then they kind of develop a sort of idea of what the current frameworks are and then they go back to their countries and then they try to spread the as you're just dis as you're just discussing but i think that the point that i'm trying to make is that it's the critical it's the critical act that is really the important act so you know yeah like some frameworks are actually better than other frameworks absolutely there's no doubt and, uh, and maybe there is such a thing as progress, although I'm pretty dubious about that idea, right, as a concept. But, you know, if there's a framework that you learn about here at Rutgers or in, in Australia and you want to, you know, bring it back to, um, you know, Indonesia, like, that could be a very valuable thing to do. But at the same time, it's maybe not about the flow of normative frameworks, maybe it's about the critique of normative frameworks. Right, so if you can approach it more as like, you know, how do we critique this normative framework, and maybe introduce it in that way, so you can say, oh, but this this idea I learned about in you know Australia or here at Rutgers, um, in, but let's break it down, and like let's look at what you know is it is it applicable to the local context? I mean that's the problem, right? Is that these frameworks kind of exist at this meta level, and they're not really that applicable to like anything that's actually happening. Because humans are just living their lives, right? They don't know. They don't care about these frameworks. It's like what? <laughs> so there's this massive disconnect, and that's fine. And that's actually probably better that way. We don't want to have everybody living their lives like you know within these normative frameworks of this scary authoritarian world, right? But um, I think again, the critique, the critical act, is kind of I think the important step. Maybe. And he, hey Mark. <laughs> this is Mark Flanagan. He's one of my co-workers and one of my colleagues at the Japan ICU Foundation. <laughs> really 
Yeah, there he is. <laughs> there's Mark. And there's Alex. And there's Nella. <laughs> some people you know, some familiar faces. You were taking the picture? I know I'm there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, if there's no final questions, I guess. Yeah, you know, or if people want to talk more about to talk themselves, I'd be I'd love to hear more about you know what you guys are doing too. So it's up to you. Do you buy this idea that the critical I'm theory not, is yeah. a sort of ethical, really it's an ethical yeah. practice? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, et ethics within the framework, you know, not not like a you know, morality, you know, but ethics is in like how do we live our best lives here, like you know, this life, like. That's what I mean by ethics. I don't mean, you know, how do we atone for our sins or you know anything like that. You know, uh, that's not ethics. That's the sort of well, it is. It's, it's been usurped. You know. So we have to take ethics back. You know. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm happy if you guys do want to talk more. You know. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for visiting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.